live translation than uh, the recording of it. So I'm really happy to announce the first lecture in the series of uh, honorary lectures on political economy in the memory of Alberto Alessina. Uh, and this uh, four lectures uh, from uh, like very famous political economy professors from all around the world, leading political economists who are friends and colleagues of Alberta, uh, will be giving this le uh, uh, these lectures. The uh, Alberto Alessina was uh, basically one of the founders of the modern political economy. And he was a, a very influential uh, economist who very unfortunately passed away uh, the last May uh, prematurely. And uh, he was a, a very dear colleague and dear friend of uh, many people who played a huge role in the in both in developing professionally in, in, and uh, particular people, including me, he was my advisor. Uh, he played a, a great role in my professional establishment. So uh, we are um, organizing this lecture to commemorate his, his memory. And uh, the lectures will be given by four of his co-authors and colleagues and friends. Uh, after today's lecture today, I, I will I will introduce today's uh, uh, Gide Tavellini, who will be giving today's lecture a little bit later. But just to announce that the, the next three lectures will be given in the next uh, three weeks, and, and it will be lectures given by uh, Ekaterina Jovaska, who will be talking about the spread of mobile internet and its impact of confidence in government. Then we'll have Eliana LaFerrara from Bacconi University will be uh, talking about diversity and, and discrimination and changing of stereotypes. And finally, uh, we'll have a lecture by Elias Papayanao from London Business School, who will be closing the series and delivering a lecture on the role of different factors determining social mobility. Um, and you can uh, access all these lectures and all our public lectures at, at the website of the New Economic School. Uh, they're all freely available in both Russian and English languages. And um, final, uh, final, Organizational couple of organizational announcements. Uh, first, uh, any one of you who is interested in applying to New Economic School, uh, uh, please um, uh, take a note that the NAS admission office will have be holding several information sessions in November, uh, and please uh, uh, attend them if you are considering applying. The, the links will be provided in the chats. So we'll uh, we'll today we will also be uh, we're trying to encourage you to give uh, to uh, to ask questions so we'll have two prizes one for a Russian question in Russian uh, and we'll give like uh, uh, will be provided by Alpina publisher uh, publishing uh, house who, who will be uh, giving the um, electronic versions of 13 different books in economics there will be also uh, a, a prize for the best English uh, question, uh, and it will be a two-month subscription for the Bookmate ebook service. And we'd also like to help uh, to to thank for helping us to organize uh, this uh, NAS public lecture series, the Safmar Charitable Foundation, and our media partners, which are TV uh, the TV Rain. Uh, broadcast channel and our partners also include the cons online publishing house alpine publisher and uh, the moscow times and now finally let me move to the main like uh, to the main topic of today's lecture and introduce you um uh, professor Gide tabellini who is actually a, with with alberto is probably one of the uh, people who uh, can be considered one of the founders of the uh, of the contemporary political economy, uh, who was a co-author of the big, probably what is still considered to be the main textbook uh, on political economy, together with Thorsten Person. And uh, Professor Bellini is a professor of economics in Bacconi University since 1994, and he has uh, been a rector uh, of that university for four years, and he has a, 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 a very long list of all different honorary uh, prizes, uh, et cetera, including the, the foreign honorary member of American Academy of Art and Science, the Fellow of Econometric Society. He was the president of the European Economic Association, and he was receiving Usher Johnson Award for the uh, from the European Economic Association. So the, uh, the list of, is very long, but, but um, what is also actually important for this series, obviously, that uh, Guido was a long-term uh, co-author and friend of uh, Alberto, and he will be delivering uh, uh today uh the lecture based on their joint work uh on the op which asks the question is europe an optimal political uh, area from a point of view of trade of trade-off between public goods and uh, provision and uh, diversity and the role of economic integration in causing the stability of eu uh but before giving floor to to, to Guido, uh last one organizational thing uh, i hope that now by now you all answered the poll 
uh, on, on whether you're located from. So I, I really hope we can now show uh, the map, uh, which would uh, um, which uh, would be um, showing us where 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 people are coming from. Uh, again, so we are really happy that uh, again we can see people coming not all not only from all over Russia, uh, but actually coming as far as I see, it's like previously from Boston to Shenzhen in China. So we really, really, really uh, uh, glad that we have this, this international audience. And uh, now all of you can uh, listen to this uh, great lecture by uh, by Professor Dablini and Guido. I'm handing the floor to you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, everything is great. Uh, so th thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here uh, and uh, give a lecture in the memory of Alberto. Alberto and I became friends when we were just out of uh, university and remain very close friends uh, ever since. And uh, uh, it's a huge loss personally and professionally, of course, uh, not to be able to share thoughts and see him uh, uh, as often as we often did. Uh, I would like to present uh, uh, the last paper that I wrote with Alberto. Uh, as always, uh, uh, this is of course a recent paper, uh, and uh, as always, uh, uh, it was great fun. Uh, one of the feature of Alberto was that uh, he helped you uh, identify interesting issues and immediately saw the important uh, aspects of a problem. And uh, uh, this was also the case uh, in, in this uh, joint paper, which uh, is also joined with uh, Francesco Trebbi, uh, now at Berkeley, uh, who also was uh, a student of, of Alberto. So in, uh, in this paper, uh, we are motivated by uh, this picture. So uh, we often think that uh, eventually, as a goal, Europe uh, should uh, gain further European, Euro further political integration. But looking at these pictures that were taken in 2010 during uh, the sovereign debt crisis, of course, this gives you pause and some doubts. On the left, you see how Greece was perceived uh, in Germany. Uh, on the right, you see how Germany was perceived in Greece. Uh, and so these pictures would suggest uh, that maybe uh, it's really a, a dream to think of uh, uh, feasible political integration in Europe. Our punchline in this paper is that these uh, pictures are, of course, exaggerations. Uh, and uh, the stumbling block uh, in European political integration is not so much that countries differ, as this picture would suggest. Uh, we are, as European, much more similar than this picture suggests. Uh, and the stumbling block uh, is more our sense of national identities, which of course is not an artifact, it's important, but it reflects more stereotypes and tradition than fundamentally uh, important uh, cultural uh, uh, differences. So that's the punchline. And uh, to uh, uh, organize the thoughts, we proceeded uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, a trade-off that was emphasized uh, in one of the important work of Alberto Lesina, in this case joined uh, with uh, uh, Enrico Spolaore, where they discussed what is the optimal uh, size uh, and number of nations. And uh, in thinking about what is an optimal political area, they suggested that the answer has to be thought in maximizing over the following trade-off. On the one hand, to exploit economies of scale and, uh, and economies of scope uh, in the provision of public good, you would like um, a political area to be large. Uh, if you make this uh, political area 
too large, however, then there is the cost of dealing with heterogeneity of preferences, um, which makes decision making more difficult. And of course, it could be problematic for um, the groups that are left in the minority. Um, and so we started thinking about uh, uh, what this uh, trade-off implies for uh, European uh, political integration. And um, with regard to the first aspect of the trade-off, economies of scale in the provision of public goods, I think there is a very large agreement, not just uh, uh, between researchers and politicians, but in public opinion at large, that uh, there are very extensive and important economies of scale uh, in the provision of public goods. And uh, so in 2016, Eurobarometer uh, asked representative samples of European citizens uh, whether they were in favor of more decision making at the European level in the areas listed in this slide. Uh, and as you see, 80% of respondents said that they were in favor of more EU decision making with regard to fighting terrorism, promoting peace and democracy, which mean, largely means defense and foreign policy, environmental policy, uh, energy, and uh, surprisingly, even immigration policy. So the answer to the trade off is clearly we want more uh, integration in these areas. Of course, not everywhere, but in these particular areas. Uh, and so what we then uh, studied in this paper uh, is to what extent heterogeneity of preferences uh, amongst the European citizens is a stumbling block uh, in the road towards more political integration. And, and so in particular, we ask whether Europeans, as uh, apparent from survey data, uh, whether they are too different from each other uh, or whether they are sufficiently similar. And uh, uh, we focus in particular on uh, heterogeneity in, culture, in deep and fundamental cultural traits. And then we ask whether the decades of economic integration have made the, the trade-off between economies of scale and, and the heterogeneity of preferences more or less favorable in the sense um, of uh, uh, asking whether uh, economic integration has increased the heterogeneity or diminished heterogeneity in uh, these uh, cultural traits. Um, and uh, so this is what I will be talking about. First, we ask how different are Europeans in their cultural traits uh, between each other compared to the heterogeneity that we observe the within member states in the European Union and also uh, within and between US states. Then we ask whether there has been a cultural convergence uh, over time, uh, because the functioning of institutions is also one aspect that is often discussed when uh, you think about European integration. We also ask whether there has been uh, institutional convergence or divergence. And then I close with a discussion going back to the question of what all of this implies for uh, the uh, road towards uh, further political integration uh, in Europe. Our sample of countries is um, the EU 15 plus uh, Norway. I'm not sure why Norway is there. We started with Norway and then we kept it. What is important is that we are not including uh, countries in cent Central and Eastern Europe uh, and uh, we focus on the period between 1980 and 2008. So this is before the financial crisis and of course before the, the COVID crisis. Uh, so this was a period uh, probably of uh, uh, in, uh, very important step forwards uh, uh, in economic uh, uh, integration and to some extent also political integration. Um, and. Uh, when thinking about heterogeneity in cultural traits, 
we, of course, rely on questions that are repeated over time and that cover a broad range of countries. Uh, and uh, this uh, left us with 20 questions on five deep dimensions of uh, an individual culture. Before I comment uh, on uh, what they are, uh, the reason for focusing on these particular sets of questions is that we consider political integration like a very open-ended and incomplete contract, like a marriage. And uh, so it's important that when you marry, you don't share the superficial tastes and preferences, but you share a common view of the world, a common set of values. And, and uh, likewise, when you integrate politically, what is important is not what you think about uh, uh, very topical issues over which your preferences may change, but uh, what are view, your view about the role of the state, uh, uh, the role of individuals and, and deep and fundamental um, um, uh, value systems. So guided by these uh, thoughts, we uh, have questions, as I said, on, on five dimensions. One is uh, religiosity, not, not religion, but religiosity. So. Uh, the importance of religion and the importance of issues over which religion speaks, like euthanasia or suicide or divorce. Second, gender equality. So the role of women in uh, uh, the family and uh, in the marketplace, in the economy. Your sexual morality. So uh, your views on abortion, on homosexuality, on divorce. Um, a set of questions on the economic role of the state with regard to redistribution uh, versus individual responsibility, uh, regulation, protection of property rights, and also political ideology. Uh, and then some fundamental values and civic capital, uh, like what qualities do you uh, appreciate the most uh, in children, uh, and uh, your generalized trust and your self determined your view about how uh, able you are to control your life. Um, many of these uh, uh, features have been studied uh, uh, in the literature on economics and culture, uh, and they have been shown to be fairly persistent over time. They don't change so much. Uh, so you can think of them as, as, as deeply held feature, cultural features of individuals. Uh, and they are also important in the sense that they are correlated with uh, important economic uh, and social outcomes like uh, participation of women in the labor force, uh, economic development, uh, uh, corruption and governance. So these are the issues over which we try to assess homogeneity uh, versus heterogeneity of uh, uh, Europeans. Um, so uh, we, I should say also that the results are fairly robust to uh, looking at the subset of these cultural traits. So um, it's um, which particular question you drop or include uh, is not so so important for the qualitative results that I'm describing. Um, then, because of the computational problems, we did not keep all the respondents, these surveys have 1500 individuals uh, and they are a representative sample. We took uh, at the beginning 250 individuals per country, um, but then we repeated the analysis for 500 individuals uh, and uh, the results are very, very similar. So in the set of slides, I'm going to show you the results for 250 individuals, 16 countries, uh, and four waves between 1980 and 2008 at about uh, uh, seven or eight years distance uh, from each other. Uh, a few countries are missing in, in some waves. So uh, for all the, this, these are not panels, so uh, it, uh, they are repeated cross section. So for each of these respondents, think of them as individual I, we have 20 answers to the questions that were asked. So for the mathematically oriented, 
uh, this is a vector of responses. So it's a point on a space with 20 dimensions. And we want to know how these individuals who give these 20 responses, uh, how do they differ from each other? And so what we do for all the respondents in the sample, for all of these individuals, we compute the cultural distance based on uh, uh, this formula, which is the formula for the Gaussian kernel, which um, essentially uh, amounts to taking the, if you're not familiar with the math, amounts to taking the average between these uh, individual responses, weighting them equally. So are, we are not giving more weight to some answers than to others. Um, and then we ask uh, uh, how we, we depict the distribution of individual distances in the sample of respondents. Uh, and I'm going to show you two pictures. One uh, is, is the raw distance. We call it the unconditional distance between these individuals. Uh, but then because these individuals uh, have uh, observable features that make them different, like their age, their gender, their education, where they live and so on, uh, we also take into account these observable social demographic uh, features of individuals and, and what I call distance uh, uh, in conditional culture is the distance between two individuals who have uh, the same social demographic features. So the same education, the same gender, the same age and so on. So I'm going to show you for uh, uh, the sample uh, the picture of uh, raw distances, unconditional, and conditional, which means uh, taking into account uh, uh, their observable social demographic features. Again, for uh, the more mathematically oriented, the conditional culture is the distance of the residuals of uh, each cultural traits uh, on their uh, socioeconomic uh, characteristics. Uh, and uh, these are. Uh, the distributions of uh, distances between two individuals. So I'm going to spend some time describing uh, these uh, pictures because I'm going to show you quite a lot. On the left-hand side panel, we have uh, the unconditional distance. So what I call the, the raw distance between two individuals. And on the right, instead, we have the conditional distance, taking into account uh, their observable features. Uh, and take the dotted line. Uh, the, uh, so the dotted line depicts the distribution of distances between two individuals in our sample who belong to the same country. So some individuals are identical. They have zero distance. Uh, distance is normalized so that it is maximal at one. Uh, and so uh, some individuals are very different and uh, uh, they have a difference of one. And, and then there are many other individuals who uh, are somewhat different from each other. And you see the mode uh, and the, the mean is close to about 0.5. And then the red line gives again the distribution of distances uh, for two individuals in the sample who belong to different countries. Again, some of them are identical, very few, but then as you uh, move at larger distances, you see that there are more and more individuals who are at a distance of about 0.5. And then when you take very large distances again, uh, these uh, uh, numbers uh, go down, the frequency of the distribution falls. Uh, and to the right, you see exactly the same picture, uh, but uh, taking into account uh, these individual features. Now, what is remarkable about uh, these uh, two distributions and what surprised us the first time we saw it is uh, how similar they are. Uh, the, of course, as one would have expected, the distribution of distance uh, for individuals belonging to different countries is shifted to the right. 
on average, uh, two Europeans belonging to different countries are more different than two Europeans belonging to the same country. So as one would have expected, we are more different uh, across countries than within countries. But the striking fact is that we are not much more different uh, between countries. In fact, the mean distance uh, on average is only five percentage point higher for Europeans belonging to different countries compared to Europeans belonging to the same country. So to us, this suggests that uh, we are not uh, that different from each other. And return to this theme uh, several times. Uh, so one reaction you could have is that. Uh, so one re so one question is: Could could uh, this be due to the fact that we are just uh, measuring uh, these cultural traits with huge error? And I think the answer is not for two reasons. One reason is that uh, the variability within countries is. Uh, uh, 10 times larger than the variability between the country means. So uh, if this was due to measurement error, it should mean that the variance of the measurement error is uh, very, very large. It's nine times uh, the observed variance between the country means. This seems implausible. It would really imply that uh, these uh, uh, survey responses are meaningless. Uh, the second observation is that if you uh, take uh, uh, Turkey well as democracies, uh, despite uh, these very large heterogeneities within countries, uh, then we ask a number of natural questions. One question is uh, what explains cultural distance between individuals? Um, and um, uh, here you see some plausible answers, namely, uh, uh, cultural distance is explained by socioeconomic distance. On the vertical axis, you have cultural distance. On the horizontal axis, you have distance in the observable socioeconomic traits of individuals like age, gender, education, and so on. The two are related. Uh, and uh, the second picture uh, displays uh, the correlation between in the cultural distance between two individuals and the distance in geography between the places uh, 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 where they live. And again, there is a positive correlation. But um, the striking feature of these graphs, if you look at the number uh, that are written here, is that the intercept is an order of magnitude bigger than the slope. Remember that uh, uh, both variables uh, here uh, vary between zero and one. Uh, and so this suggests that cultural distance is largely unexplained by these uh, observable features like uh, socioeconomic traits and geographic distance. Um, a second question we ask is, uh, where is the cultural core of Europe? We are used to thinking that uh, in the European Union, there is an economic core associated with uh, Germany and France, and then there is an economic periphery. Uh, so you can ask the same question, where is the cultural center of Europe, which we define as uh, 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 formally as the centroid of uh, these uh, uh, vect individual vectors. Um, more leisurely, uh, the centroid, you can think of it as just as the mean of these cultural traits. So you can compute the mean of these cultural traits in this uh, 20 dimensional space. And then you can compute the distance of each individual, not from another individual, but from the cultural center of Europe. And because we know the region of residence of each individual, you can also then take the regional average of uh, the distance from the, the cultural center of Europe. Uh, and then you can look at the map, and this is what uh, this does, uh, to see which regions uh, are further away from the average of uh, Europe, from the cultural average of Europe. And to read this map, uh, lighter color mean smaller distance, 
darker color mean larger distance. Switzerland is not in our sample, and so uh, don't confuse it. This uh, uh, shaded gray means that, that no data are available. So what does this picture tell you? Well, it tells you that the cultural center of Europe, again, is Germany. So it coincides with the economic core. However, the cultural periphery does not coincide with the geographic or with the economic periphery. So if you look at Greece or Spain or, or Southern Italy, they are not that uh, more different than many regions uh, in uh, France and of course uh, in, in England. So although the economic core and the cultural core coincide, the economic periphery does not seem to be a cultural periphery in terms uh, of uh, cultural traits. This is important because if economic differences combine with cultural differences, this makes uh, political integration more, uh, more complicated. Instead, the regions that seem to be more distant uh, uh, tend to be in France, some, sometimes in, uh, uh, in Northern uh, Europe. Uh, uh, and more generally, this uh, pictures reinforces the point that there is a lot of heterogeneity within countries. If you look at, it, at Italy, but also uh, Northern Europe, you see a lot of uh, heterogeneity within uh, these countries. Uh, another question that we ask with these data is whether uh, your distance from the center, your cultural distance from the center, explains your attitudes of being in favor or against the European integration. You would expect that individuals who are more distant from the average uh, are more skeptical of European integration. And, and this is indeed the case. So we computed here as a dependent variable, uh, a variable that we call fear of European integration. And this is uh, uh, the first principal component or the average, more loosely speaking, of uh, five questions about whether you are in favor or against uh, European uh, integration in uh, four or five different specific areas like uh, uh, immigration or uh, monetary union or fiscal policy. And uh, uh, the average of these questions, uh, a higher value meaning that, meaning that you are more skeptical, we call fear of European integration. And then we ask whether you can explain in these individual traits this uh, Euroscepticism by looking at uh, the distance of the individual from the cultural center of Europe, controlling for uh, individual, in some regressions, controlling for uh, the individual features like his gender and education, and also taking into account the country where he lives and the region where he lives. And uh, as one would have expected, individuals who are more distant from the center are more Eurosceptical. So that confirms that our measure of cultural distance uh, is meaningful. However, if you look at uh, these uh, estimated coefficients uh, based on how these variables are defined, although statistically significant, they're very small. Uh, and in, in practice, what they mean is that if uh, you uh, imagined a reduction of cultural distance from the uh, average value in the sample to the minimal distance that you observe, you would reduce fear of integration by only 6% of its average. So a very big reduction in cultural distance is associated with uh, a very small reduction in uh, Euroscepticism. So this reinforces the point that it is not likely that uh, heterogeneity of preferences is at the core of uh, what uh, uh, prevents uh, further political integration in Europe. Um, okay, so 
thinking about the outline, and I wanted to ask, uh, are we Europeans different from each other? The answer is not much. I now want to, at least if you compare it with the heterogeneity that we observe within countries, I now want to compare heterogeneity in the traits of Europeans between Europeans to the observed uh, heterogeneity between uh, Americans who live in different American states. See whether the US is more uh, uh, homogeneous uh, culturally than Europe. Uh, so, for that purpose, we looked at another survey. Uh, it's called the GSS survey, which uh, is uh, asked uh, uh, over a similar period and asks similar questions to the ones that we used. Here we were constrained to identify. 15 questions in this American survey that are almost identical to uh, the European survey. And so for that reason, we could not uh, have 20 questions, but we only uh, looked at, uh, uh, at five. And uh, uh, another problem is that uh, the GSS respondents are not so many, and uh, uh, we wanted to uh, look at respondents belonging to different areas in the US. Um, and so we only confined attention to uh, the largest uh, US states where we could have at least 60 respondents. The results are similar, and these are nine states. The results are similar if instead we look uh, at uh, uh, five macro regions rather than nine large states. Uh, and this is the uh, description of what we find uh, for the US. Uh, so again, the left hand side is the raw distance between two random respondents. The right hand side is the distance taking the distribution of distances taking into account uh, your uh, uh, individual features. Here we describe two distributions, they are really superimposed one on the other. You can only see one, but they are two. One is the distribution of distance of uh, two Americans uh, belonging to the same state, and the other is the distribution of distance of two Americans belonging to different states. So here, uh, the two distributions overlap. Belonging to different states uh, does not make you more different uh, uh, than belonging to the same state. So you may argue, haha, now we see that Americans are more similar than Europeans. That's actually not the case. The reason why these two distributions overlap is not because uh, Americans belonging to different states are more similar, it's because Americans belonging to the same state are more different compared to Europeans belonging to the same state. And this is illustrated uh, in the next picture, um, which uh, depicts the distribution of distances in the uh, US, the solid line, and in uh, uh, Europe, the dotted line, for residents of the same European state in Europe and the same American state in the US. And you see, that distances within state are bigger in the US than in Europe. Here instead, we plot the distribution of distances for residents of different states in Europe and in the US, and the distributions are, are, are similar. So uh, again, compared to uh, the US, we can say that the heterogeneity that there is uh, between uh, uh, EU states uh, uh, is similar to the observed heterogeneity in cultural traits between US states. The next question we ask is whether we have seen uh, a decrease or an increase over time in uh, uh, this uh, uh, cultural heterogeneity. Um, and uh, of course, this was a period uh, of uh, economic integration, the period between 1980 and now. Uh, I should say, um, up to now, I have talked about Europe in the last wave, so in 2008. 
uh, only looking at the, the last wave. Now I'm exploiting instead the change in uh, um, uh, uh, cultural traits between 1980 and now. Uh, and so uh, we want to ask the following question. We know that between 1980 and now, we had very successful economic integration in Europe. Uh, there's been the single market. We have seen uh, uh, in, a substantial increase in trade within Europe, increased uh, migration, uh, the single currency with increased the financial integration. Up to the year 2000, there has also been economic convergence uh, and uh, uh, there has also been increased uh, co-movements at out of output at the business cycle frequencies. Uh, and this meant that the policy issues that were facing different European countries have become more similar throughout this period. Also, and this is relevant for uh, forming our priors, uh, there has been no increase in overall income inequality when you pull together the income of all uh, residents of Europe. Uh, there's been maybe increase in inequality within some countries, but uh, uh, for the 16 countries altogether, if you look at uh, the distribution of income uh, has not become more unequal. One reason being that uh, the lower income countries have converged to some extent to the European average. Uh, and uh, so all of, all of this from an economic point of view would uh, lead you to expect that economic integration brought about some cultural convergence because we interact more frequently through trade migration. Uh, we share more similar policy challenges. One reason why uh, perhaps uh, uh, the uh, force could be going in the opposite direction could be that trade integration leads to economic specialization. And we know that if you specialize, uh, uh, this may make you uh, more different to exploit uh, uh, to exploit gains from trade. So a priori, we are not the sure, but uh, I confess that we were expecting uh, some cultural convergence because of uh, these a priori arguments. And instead, we find divergence. So here, it's the same exercise as before, uh, except that we are plotting uh, in solid the distribution of cultural differences in the last wave, so in 2008, for individuals belonging to different countries. And the dotted line is the distribution of distances for individuals belonging to different countries in 1980. And you see that the distribution uh, in the recent wave is clearly shifted to the right by about 10 percentage point. So we have become more different uh, than we were between 1980 and now. Uh, and the same is true uh, if you take into account the uh, uh, socioeconomic features of, uh, uh, of these individuals. And we repeated this exercise for uh, individuals belonging to the same country in the bottom part of the picture. Uh, and again, we see uh, increased divergence, a shift to the right of the distribution. So uh, this suggests that, that maybe uh, the reason why we have become more different as uh, Europeans is uh, not necessarily related to European integration, but it's because of increased heterogeneity within countries. We have all become more different. We don't know why. And maybe I suspect that the social media and the internet may be responsible for uh, these uh, increases in heterogeneity. But uh, the lack of convergence or the cultural divergence is not uh, just a feature of uh, between country distances. It's also shared within countries. Uh, then we digged a little bit more deeply into the sources of uh, these uh, 
um, cultural differences uh, and, uh, and uh, convergence. And uh, uh, so we looked at each of the five dimensions uh, of cultural traits that I summarized before, uh, we find the increased dispersion over time in almost all dimensions. So it's not just a feature of a subset of these questions. And, and also uh, we looked at individual countries and this uh, uh, is what we do in this uh, picture. So here I'm displaying uh, one particular set of traits relating to uh, gender roles. So this is the first principal component uh, uh, of uh, uh, the questions on gender roles. Uh, the dotted line displays how this trait has evolved over time. It's the same dotted line in each panel. Uh, and then the solid line is how the, the trait evolved in the particular country. So in this case, in Austria, here in Belgium, in Denmark, and so on. Higher values of the trait mean that you are more modern in your attitude. So you are more uh, favorable to equality of gender in uh, uh, the household of roles of males and females in the households and in the economy. So everybody has become more modern. But if you look at this picture, the some of the divergence seems to be due to the fact that uh, Northern Europe has become more modern at a faster pace than Southern Europe. Southern Europe has uh, uh, slowed down a bit this modernization of its culture compared to Northern Europe. Uh, and uh, the same is true in uh, other cultural traits. Uh, and uh, then we ask the same question for the US do we see cultural divergence or convergence in the US? So these pictures refer to the US. The solid line is uh, the distance, distribution of distances between individuals belonging to different states in 2008. Uh, the dotted line, it refers to 1980. And you see that here too, the distribution has shifted the, to uh, the right. So cultural divergence has taken place in the US as well. So answer to my second sets of questions, have we become more similar or more dissimilar? We have become more dissimilar everywhere within countries in Europe, uh, in the US. This to some extent seems to be due to a divergence between the more modern and the less modern part of uh, our samples. Uh, but it's hard to blame this on European integration, given that it has taken place in the US and within countries as well. Last question. Uh, can we say something about uh, whether the functioning of institutions have converged or diverged over this period? We know that um, uh, institutional convergence uh, uh, is uh, 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 often uh, thought to be an, uh, an important goal in European integration. Some programs like the Lisbon program aims to uh, achieve convergence in policies and in functioning of institutions. Has this taken place or not? So here, uh, again, uh, we have ambiguous priors. On the one hand, there were deliberate efforts at harmonization. Uh, and so we would expect some institutional convergence. On the other hand, uh, trade integration may have led to specialization and specialization may lead uh, to structural change in the functioning of institutions also within countries. So to answer this question, we collected data on four sets of indicators of institutions. One set of indicators are survey-based measures on the quality of government uh, within each country. Uh, these are uh, surveys of international investors who uh, ask you uh, how different components uh, of governance system of countries uh, uh, perform, uh, how reliable is the legal system, how much corruption there is, uh, uh, 
how property rights are protected. And, and then we aggregated all these different indicators in a summary indicator of the quality of government. A more specific in a set of indicators refers to legal institutions, to the functioning of legal institutions. This is, uh, uh, again, it's an average of many different indicators. Some are based on survey data. Others are based on uh, uh, factual data, how long it uh, takes to resolve uh, a particular legal case or how is uh, uh, how independent, uh, uh, who appoints the judges, how independent are they from the political system and so on. Then we have a, a number of uh, uh, indicators on uh, the extent of, of product market regulation, to what extent uh, is uh, uh, product market regulation conducive to well-functioning competitive markets. And finally, a set of indicators on the functioning of uh, the schooling and the schooling system. These are PISA scores. Uh, as you know, PISA scores are uh, tests uh, that are asked uh, to uh, uh, students at different levels uh, of education within the schooling system uh, on uh, math, reading, and science. Uh, it's the same set of uh, tests to make it comparable across countries. So you can view these as uh, educational achievements that measure the functioning of uh, uh, school systems. And, and, and these are, are uh, pictures that describe how the variability of these indicators across countries has evolved. So uh, uh, for those of you who know the, uh, the literature on growth, they are called uh, sigma, con uh, this depicts the sigma convergence between countries. And essentially one point in this uh, picture shows you the cross country variability at this moment in time. So uh, this is uh, uh, the quality of government indicator. Variability has decreased uh, between the beginning of the sample and the year 2000, countries have become more similar in the, in the quality of their government. But then since the year 2000, they have diverged. When you look at the quality of legal institutions, again, you see increased divergence over time. So this is not very encouraging for European integration. The bottom panel is more encouraging, surprisingly perhaps, uh, the PISA scores have converged and they have become more similar. Uh, this has been both because the South has improved, but also because uh, the champions uh, in the North, Sweden in particular, have deteriorated during this period. And, and the, the regulatory environment has also become more similar. This is not surprising. This was really an effort at the uh, product market harmonization. So divergence is confined to the broad uh, governance indicators and the, and the legal uh, systems. Uh, and uh, here too, the reason why we see uh, increased variability is because the north of Europe, who was strong, has become stronger, and the south of Europe, who was weak, has become weaker. So this is the uh, time profile, not of the variability, but of the level of the quality of legal institutions in different countries. Uh, so uh, summarizing, uh, has there been institutional convergence during this period? No uh, mixed, some divergence in some dimensions, some convergence in others. Uh, so let me try and, and recap and go back to where we started from. We started with a discussion of uh, this key trade-off emphasized by Alesina and Spolaore between economies of scale and scope in public good provision, which calls for more integration versus heterogeneity in uh, preferences, uh, which calls for less integration. And uh, uh, the conclusion to which we are pushed 
from this data is that heterogeneity in the deeply held cultural traits does not seem to be a stumbling block, despite the lack of cultural and institutional convergence, um, not because we are similar, but because there is a lot of heterogeneity already within countries that function well as uh, democracies like single member states or the US. So uh, what is it? This doesn't mean, of course, that Europe is ready to become much more integrated politically, although COVID has uh, uh, allowed uh, Europe to take an important step forward with uh, the proposal of the recovery fund. Uh, but of course, we are still not ready to integrate politically. And the, the reason that we think is preventing uh, deeper political integration is uh, linked to our national identities, to our feeling of uh, being Italian as meaning something specific uh, attached to my own history. Uh, and being German uh, has a different meaning associated to a different national identity. So we perceive ourselves uh, as uh, uh, nationals, and this leads us to exaggerate, perhaps, uh, and stereotype some of uh, uh, the differences across countries. Here in this uh, uh, graph, we discuss, we present evidence on uh, the extent to which uh, uh, different uh, uh, Europeans feel proud of their national identity. So uh, these are different waves. Uh, and uh, as a measure of uh, nationalism, we take the question, how proud are you of your national identity? And uh, you see that uh, despite uh, integration, there has been a generalized uh, increase in your pride of your nationality. There is a lot of heterogeneity in this pride. Belgian are not particularly proud of uh, being Belgian. Uh, Irish are much more proud. Uh, but a common feature is that this number has increased over time. Um, and so we think that this is what is um, making difficult to integrate uh, politically. Notice that uh, uh, despite the rise in uh, national identities throughout this period, European identity has not weakened in the sense that uh, uh, about 50% of the respondents say that they feel both uh, national and European, and this percentage has fluctuated over time, but has remained uh, uh, fairly constant throughout this period. So. It's not that the European identity has weakened, it's more that the importance of nationalism has increased. And of course, this is also reflected in the rise of populist movements uh, uh, throughout this period. So to close, uh, if indeed we want to achieve more political integration to take advantage of the provision of European public goods, um, what are the implications that we can draw from uh, uh, this description? Well, one implication is um, we are not that different, as I emphasized. A second implication is we are not going to become more similar uh, over time, because if anything, we have become more different. It's unlikely that this trend will change. And what we need to do is to try and overcome uh, this national identity, which is good in many ways, but in this particular moment in history, is uh, perhaps preventing uh, the benefit of uh, uh, provision of public goods uh, on a larger European scale. And to enrich our European identity, uh, we can learn from uh, what member states have done. Uh, clearly, fostering a national identity was a goal of uh, uh, nation building uh, centuries ago. Uh, and to achieve this goal, education, public education uh, was a key policy instrument. And so we can think of uh, 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 enhancing uh, the uh, formation of European identity through education, both expanding 
student exchange uh, uh, beyond universities. Uh, a lot of evidence has shown that uh, surprisingly, uh, Erasmus programs and programs of exchange of students, university students within Europe have not increased the, uh, the sense of European integration a lot, probably because the students who participate in these programs by self-selection are already highly uh, pro-European. So to uh, uh, use these exchange programs to enhance a sense of a common identity, probably they have to be broadened to groups of young men and women beyond uh, uh, university students. And, and second, perhaps easier and, and uh, uh, more important, we can think of uh, uh, common elements of the European curriculum that would focus more on uh, EU institutions, EU history, uh, and what makes Europe unique uh, uh, in the world and what makes you proud of being European. And these kinds of uh, programs in national uh, educations have been very important uh, in uh, fostering uh, a common sense of identity. A second implication or second thought is that uh, the way in which you achieve integration is also important. Um, and uh, uh, the last uh, decade or so since the financial crisis has seen uh, a growth of uh, intergovernmental methods of uh, integration in Europe, uh, as opposed to building European institutions and delegating power to those European institutions. And intergovernmental methods are probably less effective in uh, uh, sustaining a common identity because each politician who participates in these uh, council meetings wants to bring trophies at home, uh, wants to show that it is pursuing the national interest. And so it's difficult to see a common good coming out of these uh, intergovernmental bargain. If instead decisions are taken by the European Central Bank or the European Parliament, this is more likely to foster the formation of coalitions across borders and the formation of uh, a stronger European identity. And finally, um, I've only spoken about uh, lack of heterogeneity within the EU 15 European countries. I have nothing to say on whether countries in Central and Eastern Europe uh, are also very similar uh, to uh, the rest of Europe with regard to their cultural traits. Uh, if they were found to be uh, significantly different, then maybe one should think again about uh, multi-speed integration. And uh, uh, in a sense, Brexit, although very sad and undesirable from the perspective of European integration, may have the benefit of uh, making it easier for the remaining countries to move forward. So let me stop here and, uh, and take your comments and, and questions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks so much. We have uh, a lot of questions. Let's say it looks like 140 questions. Uh, so, so I apologize in advance for all people who, who uh, whose um, questions I will not be able to ask. Uh, but there are like a lot of questions. Obviously, they are very much related to Brexit issue and UK and how, uh, in this sense, like whether uh, if you look at the cultural differences or political differences, what are the main driving forces first of the Brexit and how will and then if UK is out, how would it affect uh, the remaining uh, members of the European Union in that respect? So if we look at uh, the picture that I had here on how distant you are from the center, uh, you see that uh, uh, the UK was different, maybe not more different uh, than, uh, than France, but uh, it was different. So cultural difference uh, did play a role in Brexit. Uh, remember these uh, 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 shaded gray areas uh, are missing. They are not uh, similar, they're missing. So on average, uh, there is no doubt that uh, that the UK was somewhat uh, different from the rest of Europe. But I think that uh, 
uh, two components uh, in uh, uh, Brexit uh, were important. One component uh, that was documented in other empirical studies was economic uh, dissatisfaction. Um, and in particular, the periphery. So we know that London voted massively to remain uh, within the EU. And the areas that voted in favor of Brexit were the more provincial and rural areas that were uh, thought to be left behind in this uh, process of globalization and integration. So uh, there was an important element of domestic politics uh, in this. The second uh, feature that makes uh, Britain unique in some respects is uh, uh, its history. Uh, I think the pride of uh, national identity in Britain because of its history uh, is uh, uh, it's probably uh, greater than that of uh, most uh, other uh, European countries. France has an equally uh, uh, strong sense of national pride and uh, of uh, its tradition, uh, but uh, uh, it's more geographically integrated at the center of Europe. And uh, so uh, in England, you had a component of the elites and of the Conservative Party that was uh, Eurosceptical. Uh, in France, uh, this is not the case. The elite and, uh, and the policymakers tend to be much more pro-European. So in both respects, uh, I think Brexit was, uh, uh, was unique and different from, uh, from other European countries. Great. So there are an, an, another set of questions, I guess is related to, to the issue of migration from other countries to Europe and the reaction of European countries to this and uh, to what to what extent uh, the, the realignment of cultural differences is a reaction to this migration uh, and whether it actually helps to unite or divide European countries uh, in, in terms of like different different policies, different reaction to this. Uh, so I think, uh, as, as you recall in my motivating slides, I was surprised to see this, but 70% uh, of respondents in 2016, so this was uh, at the heart of the debate on, uh, on immigration, uh, were in favor of more EU level decision making on, on immigration. So it is true, it's a very important issue in all countries. But uh, uh, I don't see this uh, as a fundamental divisive issue. And uh, um, I think there is a very strong logic. If you have removed borders, like in the Schengen area, you need to have uh, a common uh, 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 immigration policy and a common border police. Otherwise, you cannot keep your borders open. So I think that um, the heated debates that we are seeing on immigration will remain important, but they will be less divisive in terms uh, of uh, European policies. They will remain politically important in each country, but the logic of saying we need to have a common immigration policy is so compelling that I, uh, I would be surprised if, if this remained uh, uh, an important divisive issue. It is a divisive issue now because th uh, there is a mismatch between how this policy is formulated and implemented and uh, the rest of uh, the uh, design of borders in Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, until uh, this mismatch is resolved, it will remain a divisive issue, but there are already steps forward that have been taken in the last very recent past in this direction. So uh, I uh, don't see immigration policy as a stumbling block. I see it as uh, very logically belonging to the set of policies that soon will have to be implemented and decided at the European level. Thanks. Uh, so another question was related to like when we uh, to the general like in this theoretical framework of uh, of the countries joining each other. Uh, what is the 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 role or the mechanism related to the competition between different jurisdictions? So that if we 
uh, if uh, we get more and more kind of unified approaches, maybe like can there be like some negative implication in the sense that we we're killing this competition? How important is this effect? Yeah, this is a very good question. I don't know whether I would give it a price, but I think it's a very good question. Uh, and uh, I think many scholars uh, have emphasized how the uh, success of Europe uh, in the centuries, so between uh, 1400 and today, is uh, also due to its political fragmentation. And uh, a political fragmentation has its costs. We had very uh, uh, terrible conflicts, but uh, it has had several benefits. It has put competition between different uh, parts of Europe uh, 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 together. Uh, it has uh, allowed freedom of thought and innovation because when you had authoritarian regimes in one part of Europe, scholars uh, and uh, artists could uh, flee nearby. Uh, it has uh, induced uh, innovation through uh, economic competition. And in a sense, Europe has had the, historically, not now, the best of both worlds because it has managed to achieve economic uh, integration despite uh, uh, the, this uh, political fragmentation and the political fragmentation allowed Europe to compete and experiment with different policies. So I think that that's been historically very important. Nevertheless, um, so uh, that's to be remembered. And uh, I, I think it, Europe would be making a mistake if uh, it would uh, uh, unify all of its policies. So here, when we are thinking about political integration, we are not thinking about uh, completely abandoning our national member states. We are thinking of uh, achieving integration in a subset of areas. And probably this slide remembers what are these most important areas. Uh, and uh, uh, Foreign policy and defense are probably, uh, together with immigration and environment, are probably the most important ones. So um, uh, two answers then I would give to, to the question. First, we are not thinking or advocating unification as a blanket, but only in uh, the areas in which uh, these economies of scales uh, are larger. And second, uh, I think, the world has become smaller because of internet, because of the growth of mankind, because of uh, improvement in transportations. Um, and it's very clear that uh, small countries uh, are not able to compete successfully in many domains related to these policy areas, but also to taxation and regulation. Uh, and you need to have a minimum scale to compete with uh, giants like China, the US, uh, India. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Europeans are well aware of this. Uh, and that's the sense in which the cost of remaining politically fragmented has probably risen compared to uh, the past. It, so another question was like related to that in, in, in initially like in, in the basic model, uh, then uh, the member states, then they basically, when they join, they basically have equal weight after all. So in reality, it looks like the different, like European countries in the European Union have different weight in political decision, economic decision. So the question like, of course, like, what do you, do we consider this model more realistic? Like with, which countries with different weight and uh, which countries are kind of playing more important role in Europe, especially, and especially like given, given the results that we have, like France is probably one of the more leading countries and that France is exactly the country with the most, like, de like, most different on cultural values. Is there any conflict in that? Uh, so I think it's clear that the leadership uh, in uh, achieving further integration has to come from uh, Germany and France. And historically, this has always been the case. Uh, and it will continue to be the case. Um, uh, so these two countries are more important when it comes to changing the status quo and taking the initiative. Uh, but this is a different issue from uh, 
whether you can preserve uh, some of the uh, bargaining power of the smaller countries. There are ways in which uh, you can preserve bargaining powers of countries. The US, as we know, has uh, two senators per state. Uh, and so you uh, can impose different majority thresholds. You can uh, uh, weight uh, decisions in different ways. Um, and uh, it's difficult to see this uh, as uh, something that is relevant uh, for uh, efficiency goals. It's very relevant for how you distribute uh, uh, benefits within the union. So it has to do with the distribution of benefits, but not necessarily with uh, the overarching goal of reaching a more Pareto efficient uh, uh, outcome. Uh, so it's something that politicians can discuss uh, it will be discussed, but there are many ways in which you can preserve uh, the bargaining power of minorities. So there's also a question like you, you showed um, the, the difference on this the kind of composite cultural measure uh, over, uh, over the, different regions. Is there any sense in which are the most salient dimensions uh, among this, I think, 20, right? Uh, you had the dimensions on this, which are really uh, make, make the, the most difference. Uh, so as I said, we did some robustness analysis. We enlarged the sample of respondents and we also dropped uh, uh, questions within this list and dimensions within the list. and. Uh, we did not notice any particular sensitivity. So it's uh, hard for me to say there is one set of issues on which uh, uh, on average countries are more different. Uh, it could be that uh, individual countries are more different on some of these issues, but we have not investigated that question. So another big set of questions actually, and you, you've mentioned that if we look at the European Union, then between countries different is comparable to within countries different. So like the other way of looking at this, maybe there is like the, uh, the, uh, the, the non-optimality is not in the way like the Europe is united, non-optimality is the way the borders of countries are drawn. And that can be like the reason of like all the separatist movements. Uh, in whatever, like past country, Catalonia, Scotland, etc. So, uh, what what's your your point of view? Is that uh, because like all, all all like the framing now was that how we unite the Europe? And maybe the, the issue is that may, the main issue is that the, the the within the Europe country borders are not. No, that I don't think is a is a big deal. As you see here. Uh, the border regions do not seem, uh, some, in some cases they are more different, in others they are not. I don't see a pattern. Uh, and uh, I think many of the country borders uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe now often coincide with geographic boundaries uh, like uh, the Pyrenees, uh, the Alps, uh, uh, some rivers. Uh, and. Uh, uh, there are some areas uh, uh, between France and Germany where the borders have shifted, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the history of these uh, member states uh, is uh, sufficiently long and uh, the geography is sufficiently varied that uh, um, these borders uh, are not particularly controversial. I think the issue of borders is very important for Africa, where clearly borders of African states have been drawn on a map by colonizers and they uh, have uh, uh, same ethnicities belonging to different sides of the borders. But in Europe, uh, there are a few border regions that are in inevitably have moved around, uh, but at least in the EU 15, that's not an issue. Maybe in Eastern Europe, that's more of a problem, but uh, uh, the the history of these uh, member states is sufficiently long that I don't see this as an issue. So, uh, the question was related to the last point of like what could make 
a more um, kind of unified approach in Europe, and especially in political institutions, which probably like, like uh, very much related to your previous wars, what other would be, for example, like in particular electoral institutions that uh, could be changed to European Parliament that could promote more kind of integrative approach, for example, if uh, if uh, members who are elected to, to European Parliament will be not based on countries, but will be allowed like uh, big parties, pan-European parties, which you can actually vote for, for representative from other countries. Will you think uh, that would help? Right. Yeah. So uh, uh, one thing I, I forgot to say that, of course, is very important is the is the language barrier. So the language is a, is a key barrier that uh, is important in uh, uh, in Europe, we are privileged to speak a common language, which is English, but uh, not, not everybody in Europe does. And uh, so that's an important uh, barrier that uh, we should not uh, forget. Um, so uh, having uh, the, the first and most obvious uh, institutional um, uh, practice is exactly what you described, namely to have uh, uh, an important fraction of the European Parliament being elected in European districts, not in national districts, that would facilitate the formation of cross-border coalitions. This is, is a proposal that, uh, uh, as you know, President Macron has formulated recently, uh, has been uh, fallen in, in uh, deaf ears to some extent, but I expect it to happen. Uh, it's a very natural thing. A more controversial issue is whether one would like to elect the president of the commission, uh, like uh, whether instead the president of the commission should be nominated by the European Parliament. As you know, now we have a, a somewhat uh, uh, in-between system. Uh, it's clearly not elected, it's nominated by the council, but uh, uh, often uh, parties in the European Parliament uh, pre present uh, their candidate for commission president uh, before the European elections. And uh, um, uh, even recently, there's been a debate between the Parliament and the Council on uh, uh, how important uh, these uh, uh, announcements uh, should, should be taken. So, there are two models uh, that one can think of. One is the US model where voters directly elect the president of the commission. And the other model is more the parliamentary model where there is a stronger link between the nomination of uh, the uh, commission president and uh, the majority in the European parliament. And, I used to be in favor of the US model, I should say. Actually, we wrote uh, uh, a CPR book uh, maybe 15 years ago uh, discussing this issue and discussing the pros and cons of the, of the, of the two models. Um, and uh, electing a commission president uh, is clearly a unifying force. And if you think about uh, many large uh, federal states, uh, they tend to be presidential, precisely because uh, the step of electing uh, uh, the executive is a unifying moment. I should say that uh, the US experience in this last election has given pause to some of these uh, ideas, because uh, clearly uh, there are also costs related to, to populism and demagogics to uh, electing an individual. You may elect not necessarily the best individual, but uh, somebody who is uh, a good seller and uh, the cost of mistakes could be, could be larger uh, with uh, direct uh, election of, uh, uh, of the president. So I would say that there are trade-offs. There is a bigger risk of making mistakes with uh, system of direct elections, uh, but uh, the symbol of uh, electing uh, the president is a big unifying moment. And perhaps I still think that uh, direct election of the president, given that the commission president is not as a powerful figure as the US is probably, uh, would probably be the best. Um, there is, however, a very important uh, 
feasibility argument, and that is that these proposals for reform have to be approved by national governments. And it's difficult to see national governments approving the idea of electing somebody who is going to be more powerful than themselves. Uh, and so I don't see this happening. I think it's more likely that um, integration will take the form of a parliamentary system. And I'm not sure that that would be the best road, however. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, and I really, again, apologize for dozens and dozens of questions uh, that were not asked. Uh, and I would like to thank Guido a lot for this uh, wonderful lecture. And uh, like also, uh, we need to hand out prizes. I think one, uh, and I had that two questions. Like one, I mean, it's obviously that Guido himself like selected the best question that was asked in <laughs> in English, and was a question well, I've read about the competition. And another prize is like the, among the questions that were initially asked in Russian, uh, the the, uh, the the best prize will go to Angelina from Irkutsk for asking the question about non-symmetric like, countries and what the different roles of different countries. So please uh, contact our administration and we'll give you these wonderful prizes. And I would really like uh, to thank once again Guido for, for amazing lecture and for the great start of this uh, series of lectures in the memory of Alberto Alicina. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.